Seahawks fans wherever you may be. Welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alpstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alvstead, here with Keith Myers, and we've got some special guests today from the uh, folks at Sports on Tap and all of their affiliate sites. We're going to learn about those guys, Sammy and uh, George Jujur, I believe is the way that <laughs> yeah. they like to pronounce that. Welcome into the That's show, good. guys. How you doing? Sports on Tap. We're going to talk about all of that stuff, some culture, weave it all together and just have a, a great time uh, getting to know these guys and what, what they're all about. I just uh, found uh, originally Sammy on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I dug in a little bit to, to what they were doing. I just found it really interesting and thought that it would be fun to share kind of their story and what they're all about with, with everyone. So welcome into the show. What's it all about? George and well, Sammy. Well, first of all, Bill, thanks for having us. Keith, nice to meet you as well, my man. Uh, really excited to be on the show and love what you guys are doing as well. So uh, Sports on Tap, man, uh, there's a lot of different uh, ways you could we could start talking about it. I'll let Sammy kind of intro it and I'll take it from there. Yeah, I mean, if we're trying to get into the full story, it can get quite interesting, but uh <laughs> Um, first of all, thanks for having us today. Well, we, uh, we signed up for the full story. So if I get short, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, that's going to bug me. So give, give, give it to me. We'll give you, I'll the, give full, you the full. full, full. <laughs> I'll give you the full story, but I'll make it in a, uh, in a cliff notes version because sure. it can get, and, and can, we can it, weave it back and forth. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, it could take a while if we gave the full story, but in, in, um, the general sense, uh, George and I, uh, grew up from our with, grew up learning about our dad's business and our family business, and um, you know George and I always kind of wanted to join some type of family business or have some type of family business. And um, at first, we began starting something on Facebook Live, and this is this gets very interesting here, where we tried to do a home shopping network type of deal on Facebook Live. So. Long story short, on that end, <laughs> that well, well, I, I want to add a little layer here, but before before we continue, how on, many so how our many purses f- how many purses did you sell? Um, not too many purses, to be honest with <laughs> with you. But I, I got some for nineteen ninety nine. But if you buy it right now, you buy one, give one free. <laughs> but wait, there's more. So actually, I just wanted to add that layer to the story. So the reason we thought about this was our father, um, Tony. Yeah, this who, is an important know, part. <laughs> yeah, he was a big mentor for, you know, our business even here. And he's helped us gain it. You know, he would always pick his brain on business. He used to run a chain of ass seen on TV stores, you know, those infomercials. And uh, you can only buy it by call now 1-800, buy one, get one free. So he started stores in the Washington State area. I'm sure a lot of people know those stores who are listening to this podcast. If you're from Washington State, he ended up with 50 stores nationwide. Um, and then, of course, just like any other business, you can probably guess where the downfall came. Uh, Amazon.com came and uh, there wasn't much of a business anymore. So we thought, how do we get creative here and help our business uh, and kind of take after our father's footstep? A home shopping network on Facebook Live in Periscope. And uh, we'll take it from there, Sammy, uh, since you painted the picture. Uh, I guess from there on, Let's just say for various reasons, it, we decided to move on. I mean, it, it, was, it wasn't doing awfully. It was just not our cup of tea. There was a certain point where I, George and I were not very satisfied selling. I mean, we, we, went, we traveled across America going to trade shows and got products and, and had like affiliate companies with us. And I, we got to a point where I was, you know, doing stuff on Facebook Live with companies selling you know, toy glitter and different things. And for me, at some point, George and I both looked at each other and were like, I I don't know if this is our, you know, necessarily the journey we're looking to go (laughs) go on. And uh, we decided we should probably just go for something at the end of the day that we love to do. Um, And we landed on sports. So (laughs) it's something that we really love to do. Um, We had a 
home shopping network that was called Sant S O N T. And that's where the abbreviation for sports on tap came from the S on the, the S on T. So it was sports on tap. And we, I would look at George in the face one day. I was like, I want to do something with sports. We have some microphones. We have some camera equipment. We had like a little studio in Everett at the time. I guess we still do have the studio, but it's not being occupied. And, um, that's how we started. So we're like, let's just go live daily on Facebook in Periscope and start talking some sports. And then we expanded from there. And we're like, let's have a Seattle affiliate because we have a lot of lean on Seattle. Let's run a website. Let's get on our social media game and have different variations, have different so podcasts. That's different where it gets cities. really interesting to me, Sammy, because you guys decided that just having a website wasn't good enough. Like that wasn't really capturing your entire message, what you guys were all about. Why not consolidate and just have it run off one central hub and have a, a few things going off of that, as opposed to just having a lot of stuff uh, in, in a lot of different areas. Um, I, that's the part that intrigues me to be completely honest. And, right. and, and also the blending of uh, the Seahawks sports in general, you guys cover a lot of different uh, sports and then the culture aspect of it as well. Um, Keith, what, what do you think? Like when you first were introduced to this kind of thing, what was your first thought that, that these guys were doing that you found maybe a little interesting? Well, I was just uh, fascinated by the, by the, uh, breadth of the topics you guys uh, write about and, and, and cover and, and um, <laughs> talk about on your, on your show. And, and, and you just seem really informed and like an expert on a lot of things. And I'm like, wow, I'm like that the research and, and time that you guys put into this is, is really apparent. And so like, that was the Thank thing you. that, that really stood out um, when I started looking into it. Um, and then the other part is I'm like, okay, you've got the, the um, on tap part, like that means, and you're from the Seattle area, you guys got to have opinions on, you know, beers and, um, you know, that scene, which is my scene. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got plenty of questions for you on that, on that realm, but we'll get so, to that later. So Keith blends the fact that he's a noted physicist and <laughs> he's a homebrew guy. So that right, is an like interesting that. topic all on its own. I mean, probably deserves a podcast just by itself. I mean, it's, you think it's interesting. I'm not sure our <laughs> listeners think it's interesting. <laughs> like, yeah. They might, they might find it interesting to drink it, Phil. True. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's really some what of, matters at the end of the day. <laughs> some of the, some of the brews have actually turned out excellent. Um, but yeah. I mean, that's that's the end. Is talking about it's different than than enjoying it. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So, you, so in the last calendar year or so, so you guys started a, a few years ago, and mm -hmm. you've just kind of allowed this thing to mature and develop. And uh, tell me about that journey in just the last year or eighteen months. That's kind of separated you a little bit and made you realize that yeah, I think maybe we want to stick with this. Yeah. Um, I think for us, just the fact that we're able to branch out into different things. So like you said earlier, we have the, C the main hub, the sports on tap, which kind of covers all sports, right? And th that's doing great. But then we started the sports on tap Seattle. I started um, Tottenham on Spurs on tap, which is Tottenham Hotspur soccer because I'm a big Tottenham Hotspur fan. So working on a podcast on that. And we started getting a fan base of just that, a fan base of just Seattle. We, were, we acquired a Chicago affiliate. We started getting a fan base of just Chicago people on that page. And we came quickly to realize sports fans are very interesting. So in general, an average sports fan, I think would really be super duper passionate. We'll use the sports on tap Seattle, for instance, about the Seattle Seahawks. They want to eat Seahawks, drink Seahawks, sleep Seahawks. They want to read and consume as much Seahawks talk as possible. But at the same time, when there's a big major event going on, like right now, the NBA playoffs, most of these people who love sports will tune in to watch 
the NBA playoffs as well. So what our whole mission and our whole goal is to kind of unite the two and eventually hopefully have more affiliates where, you know, I just moved to Phoenix, maybe a Phoenix on tap, maybe a New York on tap where these sports fans have a place where they can come together and argue sports, listen to sports, read about sports, consume sports in their local market, but then come together in one big place, which is a sports on tap hub for the major events. And that's really where we feel like, oh, okay, yeah, bingo. We there, There's a market for this that maybe is not covered in most major sports networks. So, George, are you guys doing like a discussion thread thing where you've got, you know, those sorts of forums on your websites yet? Or have you thought about maybe adding those things in time? Not quite yet. Um, right now, it's like more about just social media engagement. And we feel like that kind of is your discussion board for the moment. But we, we're always going to be open to more and trying new different things. Maybe you open a Discord. Maybe you open a Reddit page per place. Or maybe you just do it straight on your website and try to get ad revenue that way. But there's so many different avenues you can go. And I think, feel like we're still scratching the surface of our business. It seems like, like one of the taglines um, of your brand Mm-hmm. is that it's kind of like the, the uh, an internet hub where it's like yeah. a pub. People yeah, come exactly. together yeah. for sports and culture and, and it all kind of blends together. And that seems like it would be good for like a, you know, a, a fan forum type of, type of thing where people Absolutely. come on and really have those debates and interactions live on a multitude of topics and stuff. I've thought about Absolutely. it for our website, but it's a, it, it seems like it would be a lot to manage. It, it's a lot it, to I'm manage. Sure Absolutely. It's a lot <laughs> to manage. Yeah. And it, it, the, I guess the main key you said there is the internet's pub and that's where the like on tap, the sports on tap comes is George and I's goal um, in anything. And we're, we're trying to incorporate more of that community sense, like you're saying. Um, and we, cause we're going to be starting a, a daily live type of thing where we're at a very casual conversation. It's going to be like a 15, 20 minutes a day where we're just going on talking about whatever is happening that day. And it's going to be live on Twitter or Periscope, whatever they call it now in uh, Twitter live. And it'll be live on Facebook and it'd be a place where people can come in and discuss things and, and be a place where when we're talking about sports, we're not going to be too analytical. We're not trying to compete with ESPN, right? We're trying to be, those two guys that how would you talk sports with your friend at the bar or at the local pub and make it fun and interesting. And what else would you break off topics into? We've had some talks on our podcast about cryptocurrency and about beers and about a funny news story that's happened Mm -hmm. um, as well as sports. Cause that's what people you and your buddy at the bar would be talking about. And I don't know if there's enough of that in like the sports world. As as Bill said, the culture, the culture. Yeah. It's like the yeah. culture yeah. of it's the culture of sports of people who like sports, I guess. Right. They, they do expand into other topics and we like to kind of dabble in those topics and, and we're going to be doing this daily live uh, starting at the end of this week, actually. So we can find a way, like you were saying, to have more community engagement and have people come in comment. And it's like a daily you know, it's a daily place to discuss whatever you're feeling in the sports world or what you would discuss with friends at a bar. Yeah. I mean, Keith and I've had that conversation too about, uh, about our own gig. I mean, we've done two, this is our 230th episode consecutive weekly episode. That's that's great. Thank you. The, but the thing is we always kind of refer to ourselves as just two guys getting together to talk some Seahawks football, you know, it'd be the same Mm -hmm. conversation we'd have if we met in a bar and, and had a conversation about football. And we just kind of have that, you know, for our show, we don't, we've never scripted a show. We've never, I've never edited a show where we eliminate parts or anything like that. It's just yeah. the way it is. And um, so I, I, I envy the part where you're going to do it daily and, and the topics are so varied. It's like the world is your, is the, is everything. And um, yeah. that can be overwhelming to a lot of people for you guys. It's something that you totally embrace and um, realize that there's a lot of opportunity there in, in that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's, let's um, kind of go back and forth a little bit and, and let's talk about the Seahawks a little bit. Um, every time we get guests that come on that, that know what they're talking about in, in Seahawk land. And, and I'd like to get the opinions and to kind of see gauge where you guys are at. Cause I get the chance to talk to Keith all the time, right? We get, and, and so I know Keith, I know what he's going to say ahead of time. I'll ask the question anyway, just for everyone else. But, I, you know, <laughs> I like so, that. so like George, 
describe the off season to me. Like if, if you were to give an elevator talk. Oh God. Um, and this, you had, this off and, season. <laughs> exactly. And you had a minute to share like every, everything that happened in the off season yeah. with, with the dude you just met on the elevator. What would you say? I would say, I mean, to put it in layman's term, I thought we were about to go through a major divorce. And I, I don't know, there was usually when you want to save a divorce, you either, you know, go on a really nice vacation or you get a baby and there's something to really like, you know, connect it to, to save the divorce. But for us with Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll, there was nothing that, I mean, I didn't feel like there was this one key moment that saved the relationship. I feel like if there was one thing that saved the relationship, it was the maturity of Russell Wilson and the ability of Pete Carroll to maybe put his ego aside for a little bit. And I'm a big Pete Carroll guy. I've always been a, I'm always been more of a team guy than the player guy. Like I, I, I'm the type mm-hmm. who, if Russell Wilson was gone, I'd say, all right, he's gone. I'm yeah, just, you're not a I'm corporate just, guy, but you believe yeah. in the team, the longevity of the team. Itself. Yeah. The, the culture that Pete Carroll built, I think that's why we won a Super Bowl, <laughs> not just because of Russell Wilson, who, you know, was younger in his career, but the culture won a Super Bowl. So I would say this off season was chaotic. This off season was uncomfortable. It had a lot of potential. To yeah. go one way or another, right? Absolutely. And somehow it was salvaged. It really was. I mean, the relationship was salvaged. I don't know if that means it's salvaged forever. I know a lot of Seahawks fans are really like excited. Okay, Russ is staying. He's saying go Hawks now. But we got to beware because we just look at our NFC rival in the Green Bay Packers right now. They go through this every offseason with Aaron Rodgers, it feels like. And this offseason, it looks like shit really hit the fan. I don't know if we're allowed to swear on this podcast or go not. Go for it. But, all right. But yeah, it, re- it really, really went sour this offseason. So I just would like to say, even though I'm really happy that we were able to salvage this relationship with Russell Wilson, and I really think we're on the right track. If this season doesn't go according to plan, if this season has any hiccups, we might be right back at square one next offseason with Russell Wilson making noise and wanting to be traded next offseason. And he might take the Aaron Rodgers route and not show up to mini camp, not show up to mandatory camps. Mm -hmm. And we might be right back at square one. Sammy, what do you think? Oh, Sammy, we can't hear you. Okay, there we go. Sorry. I see it a slightly like a, a smidge differently because I also I feel like this is this is just the reality of NFL quarterbacks now. If you're good and you don't get what you want, the the drama happens, right? And I think fortunately for us, we have Russell Wilson who I don't think wants to be as much part of that drama. I, I think like Aaron Rodgers is embracing it, right? He's like all on board with being dramatic. <laughs> eye rolls every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's, it's amazing how on board he is with being like being the problem right now or being part of the problem. I think Russell Wilson hated that. I don't think he enjoyed feeling some tension or friction. He's a team guy, like always all in. Um, and I think he was really excited to, like George said, feel like maybe Pete Carroll budged a little bit and there, and maybe the team started helping out a little more. And I think there's a couple keys here. I think we actually did address a lot of things that he wanted to address in the off season. I don't, he hasn't had necessarily a consistent tight end, mostly because of injuries with, I know, uh, um, each, I was going to say Hollister, yeah, Jimmy um, Graham and then Jimmy and Graham Disley. and Right. Disley, thank you. There was the one I was looking for. Everybody kept getting hurt. Not much consistency. Gerald Everett's a pretty big pickup in my eyes. I mean, just in in terms of consistency, he's not a top five tight end, but he's a great piece to have on this team. Russell Especially, Wilson might turn him into one. Yeah, you never know. Mm-hmm. Russell Wilson could turn him into one. You also have the Rams, a, a former coach from the Rams with the new offensive coordinator. And I think Russell Wilson is finally getting a little bit of what he's asked for. We got Gabe Jackson in the trade who, if you look a lot of the PFF numbers, he's very, you know, he was really efficient um, in in a good guard. And I think we just kind of did the right things in the off season for the first time. And, and what do you you think about uh, for me? I think one of the biggest acquisitions that the team made was actually a coach Shane Waldron. Yeah. Do you think that that has the potential to impact Russell Wilson the most? Yeah, I think well that that's I think that's the key here, right? I think you 
kind of got a guy that at least now it's they're already going and talking about the fact that this team is going to have a new tempo and I truly believe, I feel like everybody says this every year. I really do think this is maybe finally the year Russell Wilson gets some MVP votes because <laughs> I think this is the year that the offense is actually going to be tailored for him. I think we've kind of been on and off because of the difference between coordinators and Pete Carroll. I think this is the first year that, and this is why he's happy again. I think we're going to really tailor it towards Russell Wilson and I know George doesn't love the let, let's let Russ cook uh, field or whatever. George isn't a big fan of that because we've seen it kind of go haywire sometimes. Um, but I, think I just don't like taglines. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't like taglines. But I think there's going to be a good balance this year. I think we're going to let Russ cook in the right way. And I think having the new offensive coordinator is going to be key for that. And I don't see a reason why it's not going to work out at least decently well. Uh, we've, we haven't been let down I mean, I know we feel like we're let down every year in the playoffs, but we haven't really been let down by Russell Wilson. And now we got a new offensive coordinator. So I don't see it going. Uh, I'm not, I don't see it going backwards at least. I think you guys both nailed it. You know, you guys came, came from it at a little bit different angles, but you both really nailed the off season, you know, for the most part, Keith, what do you, what do you think? Like where we're at, where we started the potential of for disaster, where we ended up landing and here we are today. The roster looks pretty decent. There might be a couple of holes that we could add to a, a little bit, but overall it, it looks like it's a, it's a roster that could compete, especially given the efficiency levels that you could realize in the offense. You had Jared Goff being the quarterback in Los Angeles with this high powered potential offense that was completely restricted to throwing underneath passes and little screens, bubble screens, all that kind of crap. He never stretched the field at all. You add that element into Shane Waldron's situation with the playmaker ability that we have on this team. Wow. I mean, it, it gets me excited. Like I'm excited about the potential for that offense and, and then some of the moves on the defense, Keith, overall, what do you think? Well, I think um, this off season for me is an incredible success. It, it had the potential, you guys have all said, to go completely sideways for Russ to just be like, no, I'm done. And the team to be like, all right, if he's leaving, we got to rebuild because they had no cap space and no draft capital. Um, so what do you do, right? You, at that point, you just start- And you have a problematic situation with Russell Wilson. Yeah, and, and so you just start ejecting people and you rebuild. Um, and then you're looking at, you know, maybe Pete Carroll retiring in a year because he doesn't want to go through a full rebuild. Um and instead, they managed to uh, improve the offensive line, improve the weapons, get Chris Carson back, um, take the defense and, you know, get some uh, additional talent up front and, and keep their safeties. And, and they just retooled in a way that you didn't think was possible based on where they started. Uh, and they kept Wilson and they, they somehow figured out how to make him happy. So you put all this stuff together and it goes from potential disaster into something that turned out really good. And you're just like, okay, like, so let's for, get the for me, going, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Like w when you say that, when you said it exactly the way that you said it, it really makes me focus on Pete Carroll and um, John Schneider. Like they were the ones that were steering the ship navigating through all of this crap that was in their way. Every possible thing that could have been in their way was standing in the way of getting to this moment. And they just went around everything and just kind of weaved and bobbed and acquired Gabe Jackson. They, they'd started with, you know, four $5 million in cap space. They, they made a, a deal with Carlos Dunlap so that Carlos Dunlap didn't leave the building pissed off. He left the building knowing exactly what was going to happen. And they took that money and, and that was seed money that they used to invest um, and, and spread out a little bit to acquire some key free agent guys. They were very patient. You know, that's, they've always been fairly patient in free agency. And this time that patience really paid off because a lot of teams were having cap issues with regards to the pandemic and so forth. And so I think they took full advantage of that and full advantage of the fact that they've been together for 10 years. There was no panic. There was no panic in the Russell Wilson situation. You know, when Pete came out and talked about in, in the press conference after the draft, uh, had an opportunity to discuss the, the, um, 
the Russell Wilson saga for the entire off season. I thought some people disagreed with the way that he approached it and what he said, and maybe discounted it or didn't believe him completely for me. And, and Keith, we were both fairly publicly facing on this issue, the entire off season with regards to kind of the way it turned out. Like it's not necessarily a non story, but it was a much bigger story outside of the organization than I think it was inside the organization. Yeah, and I, I think that, that clearly shows up in the way that we got to where we are right now. And the, the fact that we are different from Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. And I think it's a testament to, again, to Pete Carroll. And it's why he's just a solid coach. It, it just is. Yeah, yeah, he he found a way to, uh, like you said, they found a way to navigate through a bunch of crap and find a way to land in like a we're landing kind of in a safe spot. And we picked up Hyder on a good deal. Witherspoon, who's coming off injury, but like you could be very productive for us instead of paying a guy like Shaquille Griffin what he got that totally massive contract. So they did find a way to navigate through a bunch of crap and kind of land in a good spot. I think the key is. I would love to see the final. I'd love to finalize this off season before there's any other issues with potential. They've got to get an extension for Jamal Adams. Cause I don't want to see a holdout. Yeah. I had That's that like written the- down in my notes. Let's talk about Jamal Adams. Like yeah. <laughs> what's going on with Jamal Adams. I, they they got to find a way to get yeah. the extension done. We saw, I think 49ers lost their safety today, right. To a torn Achilles. Um, and this is the exact reason I know Jamal Adams is not going to show up without an extension. And so, I think they got to get that done just to avoid any, I mean, we got through so much crap, like you said, and landed in this good spot. I don't want to start the preseason or start the season with a Jamal Adams holdout to have another, another thing that's kind of holding us back. I think that would, I think the Jamal Adams. So are you willing, are you in the camp where you're willing to give Jamal Adams um, the, the leading, you know, safety salary out there of probably in, in the neighborhood of $17 million a year with, you know, 40, 45 Plus. million dollars guaranteed over four years. Is that where you're at? <laughs> I'm, I'm, we there. have to. <laughs> I think, yeah, I don't think we have a choice with the, as much capital as we gave up trading for him, as much as the, as big of an impact as he does on, has on the field. I mean, the unfortunate thing is you feel like he's more of a linebacker at times in his safety. But in, in a way, I mean, you just have to pay the market value. Is he the best safety in the league? Maybe not. But is he a top three, four, five safety? Are you going to overpay a little bit? It's better than losing him. I, I mean, I'm at, just look I, at him like a defensive weapon. Like, yeah, he's not necessarily a safety. He's not necessarily a strong side linebacker or a Leo. He's a combination of all of that stuff that you can interchange, you know, and, and that yeah. brings inherent value by itself. And that's that's the kind of the crux of the whole situation for the Seahawks. Keith, it's like, do they pay him or do they try to get, value uh, because if you're going to pay him now you're going to pay him for the next four years that's a that's a pretty decent cap hit over four years and you've got dk medcalf coming up yeah. how, how old real quick you're is jamal with bobby bobby wagner in, in a year he's, gonna, he's making 20, 17 this year he's going to make adams 20 next year adams, adams is 20 24. 24. He's still a baby yeah now we've yeah. talked about this it's like i was kind of in the camp uh, like uh, rob staten Earlier in the year, he was on the show and and he's like, you know, we've invested a ton of money in linebacker and safety on this ball club and we should be investing in, in, in the trenches, offensive line and defensive line. I kind of agreed with that. And I still kind of agree with that mentality as far as how you build a team. So it's, it's, it is a difficult payday to, to have with Mm -hmm. Adams, but then you have to take a look at everything else that Adams brings the leadership. We talk, we're going to talk about culture a little bit and kind of blend that into this, the culture of what you're trying to create on a football team, maybe not out, you know, publicly facing, but some of it is publicly facing, but at least in the, in the culture of the team itself, how important is it to have guys, alpha dogs like Jamal Adams mm-hmm. on the team and it does that send that whole contract discussion over the top and you just pay that guy. Yeah. But one thing I just want to add to what you said, Bill was like, yeah, I'm with you on that. Also the building in the trenches, investing in your offensive line, investing in your defensive line. Uh, I mean, I, I was, you know, the two most important things in football is, to me are, well, three most important is your quarterback protecting your quarterback and getting to the other team's quarterback. <laughs> but, um, but, but at the end of the day, you can only invest in what you have. 
<laughs> I mean, it's not like Va there's Von Miller's just walking around on free agency to go invest in. There's no, you know, the, the, Jamal, the Adams. Best. <laughs> Jamal Adams is what we have. And so I well, feel like you John just got to protect your assets. John Snyder's always said, listen, I want players who are going to tilt the field. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what a Jamal Adams does. Well, I I say, if you look at, if you look at the defense as a whole is who on, who on that defense has, it's going to come out and win an all pro next year. I mean, Bobby Wagner's always in the discussion because he's that good, but who else? Uh, Jamal Adams. Jamal Adams, Jamal Adams the is the option. only one. He's the yeah. only, he's the only guy that is truly uh, a guy that tilts the field. Um, yeah. on that defense. And there's a lot of really good players, uh, Dunlap up front and, you know, that kind of stuff, but you, you, you have to have some of those guys when this team was, uh, you know, winning Super Bowls and making it, it had Sherman, it had Bennett, it had Averill, it had, um, Chance. Cam, Cam and, uh, and Earl. I mean, it just, and Wagner was still there. And they had a ton of these guys that, uh, were, or were in the discussion for not just Pro Bowl, but All Pro. And Beast um, too. Got it. Can't forget that guy. Yeah, um, and so you, you know, you look at with with that, you've got they just don't have that elite guy. You can't mm -hmm. let the one you have that's young go. Yeah, I mean, because Wagner is aging. I mean, he's still awesome. Let's you know, I'm not not saying that, but he is aging. You mm -hmm. know, you've got to keep the one you've got. Yeah, if you if you told me Jamal Adams was 30 years old, I might have a whole different tune to to give you but he's 24 he's young <laughs> yeah so and let's let's start a conversation on what's going on you know right now um this week with the with the team the focus of the conversation today is going to be you know newcomers onto the team including free agency um if you guys want to talk about shane waldron a little bit and, and the effect that he might have on russell wilson and the offense um we can go through the draft guys and a few guys we want to highlight uh, undrafted guys that might have a chance. And uh, also I wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, what do you think about the Seahawks making Michael Dixon the highest paid punter in the history of all of football in the entire world? Um, we have totally different outlooks on this. Oh, one. nice. I'd love it. Let's have a debate. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll go. I yeah. love it. I think you are playing field position and it's, it's not yet, that much. Even it's if you're not that much $5 money. Million dollars, that's really only 2% or less of your entire cap. That exactly how I feel. It's not that much money. Yeah, it sounds big when you say the highest p contract in history, uh, but punters are overpaid anyway and I think he, well, he's the only punter to ever win. I think he won the Pro Bowl MVP. Am I right? He won a Pro Bowl MVP or something like that or he was had a big impact in a Pro Bowl game or something Something like along those lines. I don't think he won a Pro Bowl MVP, but maybe there's something you're thinking yeah, maybe about. There's something, there's something he did in the Pro Bowl that 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 uh, I'm gonna look this up. But um, <laughs> um, but you know, at the end of the day, he changes the game when you have play uh, play you the, can field flip the field position and, and change yeah. field position. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and he did not win Pro Bowl MVP. Someone tweeted that to me on Twitter, and I just blindly believed him. He's like, "Hey, he won the Pro Bowl MVP." I was like, "Really? He won the Pro Bowl MVP? Okay, like, yeah, I, I'm not a Pro Bowl guy. No, I'm not. Well, even. he he was the league's All Pro punter as a rookie. That is true. So, um, you know, clearly the talent's there, and he does. He he pins people deep. He he can hit those long ones um, as good or better than anyone else. And he doesn't he doesn't outcook his coverage when he kicks uh, when he kicks a sixty five yard punt because mm -hmm. he puts it so far up in the air that even at sixty five or seventy yard punt, guys are getting down there. So um, I think he's worth it. Like I know that's not going to be a popular take, but. Uh, he's an important part of what they, what Pete Carroll does because they play so conservatively at times you need someone that can flip the field for you. That's a great you, point. You just, you just hit it, uh, hit it where it hurts for me, I guess, is that <laughs> we play so conservative. I just, <laughs> listen, I understand it's the right move to pay him. He's the best punter in football and it makes sense, but it just, for some reason, it like when I saw it, it made in my head it hurt because I was like, 
This just means we're going to continue to be conservative. And I, there's nothing that bothers me more when we are overly conservative. And Pete Carroll tends to be overly conservative. And I think, I think Dixon gives him the right to continue to be overly conservative because, like you said, I've, I've maybe out of, I don't know how many punts he's had. Like, let's say he's had a hundred punts in his career. I've maybe seen like two that either fell short or a bad touchback or like out kicking the coverage. He literally at all times, at least has like an above average punt that that drops it on the 10. And the only reason that he misses sometimes is he's experimenting. He's like trying to do something different with the ball live in a game for the first time. You know, it's like, yeah, come on. No, Um, it's literally just some, some unique new technique is the only time that he might mess up. And so I get it. He's worth it. But the only reason I was bothered was that like, okay, he's giving Pete Carroll more of a reason on fourth and one when I'm like, you have to go for it here. And you see Dixon jogging out. I'm like, oh, that we, we have four more years of that. But <laughs> I will agree it's the right move. So let's let's talk about what everyone else is talking about for a little bit. Julio Jones. So Seattle missed out on Julio Jones. Um, uh, to be completely honest, if we would have spent the money and spent the draft capital and Julio Jones is lined up, you know, OTAs this week uh, with the Seahawks jersey on, I'm probably going to be pretty happy and kind of excited about the opportunity to have him on the field with Metcalf and Lockett and find out what the heck we're going to do with, with getting the ball around. Um, but now that he went somewhere else, we didn't expend that draft capital. We're not expending that cap. How do you guys feel about that missed opportunity or was it, is it, is it that big of a deal and should we be spending resources other places? I will just say, I'll let George get more deep into this, but I think because I know George, (laughs) I'll tell you guys, I think George's opinion is going to be like, thank God we didn't get Julio Jones. But (laughs) I do, I do think. I wrote a little piece on and put it on our website kind of with that effect as well. Yeah. And that's the thing. What you said was perfect. And that's why all I wanted to say was that, yeah, if we got him, I think I would have been out of this world excited, super pumped up, like, saying it's the best move ever. But now that we didn't get him, I'm just like, ah, it's probably okay. He's a little older. He got hurt a lot. And do you really need this third third guy? Like, I don't know. The Cleveland Browns were better when Odell Beckham Jr. got hurt and Baker Mayfield didn't have to force him the ball. Uh, I kind of see that with Russell Wilson or DK Metcalf, sorry, got mad at Russell Wilson one time last year and demanded the ball and was freaking out on the sideline and it led to a pick six. That is totally like, true. So like, Maybe it's okay. We in a playoff game Jones. too. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's okay. Although I would have freaked out if it happened. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things like Bill said really, really well there. Like if he was at camp this week, I'm going to be watching my shiny new toy. And I'm like, man, this is going to, this is going to be so fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but like, there's a lot of things fun in life. Like I, we have a Lamborghini in the garage with DK Metcalf. We got a nice Corvette with Tyler Lockett. Do we really need that McLaren in there too and overspend on that? Or, or should we, you know, put a good roof over our head and fix the roof or, you know, do the gutters. And I feel like that's what the Seahawks need. We didn't need another fancy sports car. And it would, but when you have it, you're, it's fun. You're going to drive it. You're going to love to look at it. You might even post a picture on Instagram with it. But well, let's, they, talk, well, let's talk about the roofs and the, and the gutters and yeah. the, the, the yard maintenance, George, what would you do? I mean, there's, there's a few remaining kind of free agents out there and we can go down the list a little bit. We got Richard Sherman, yeah. um, We've got Morgan Moses plays right tackle. We, you know, does he, would he be an upgrade over shell? Uh, KJ Wright, uh, Gino Adkins is out there. Um, I like Golden Tate, uh, Bruce Irvin still out there. So what do you guys think that would complete this roster in order to put us in the best position to get deeper into the playoffs long-term? Yeah. I'll let Sammy go first. I have some thoughts too, and see what Keith has as well, but, um, yeah, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. I think, uh, any at this point, obviously anybody we're going for is going to have to be somebody on a budget. Um, and one, I guess I'm going to stay in house for a second, which KJ Wright is something that still intrigues me a lot. And I'm not quite sure. I know if you look at the numbers, he's, uh, you know, still had one of his like 
great seasons last year. And it's weird because I feel like a lot of us think he's aging and he's not as good, but he is aging, but he's weirdly still pretty, very productive. Nobody else seems to be wanting to fork up the money to get him. So now I'm kind of in that place where I think we're able to get him. I, I'm assuming at a decent price. So I'm just kind of surprised nothing's happened yet. Um, especially the, the fact that he hasn't signed anywhere else that, you know, I'm wondering why the Seahawks haven't made that move. Um, so I would, I would really love to have KJ back. I know people worry about Jordan Brooks kind of, you know, that's kind of his spot maybe that, that he's going to be taken over, but I, w- I would love KJ right back. Just, I think it solidifies the defense and I'm going to do a former guy in house. Like you met and mentioned him, Richard Sherman, uh, who's also aged. And I think we get a good price and that he's been oddly very productive despite his age and injuries. I, I think those two guys could help solidify things less because of the production on the field, but even more because of their, like the culture fit them understanding the Seahawks organization. We do need some, we do have some depth that you depth issues at the corner position. So why not bring in a guy like Russell Wilson that can immediately click probably in this locker room, immediately click culture wise with the coaching staff, whoever it may be. And then resign a guy like KJ, right? Because I see KJ Wright kind of as the Seahawks lifer. I don't really understand why we wouldn't be able to get a deal done. It's kind of a I'll sad deal because two. as Keith mentioned last yeah. week, he thought we might be able to sign him for $2.5 million. Yeah. And you think about where he started at when free agency opened. And now I knew his market was going to not be good. And it was just one of those things where he was kind of taking a chance. It didn't work out. Now, you know, we talk about strategy, like player contract strategy and so forth. And you take a look at KJ Wright specifically, there's no real incentive for him to sign immediately today because what he's trying to do now is literally wait for injury to happen yeah. and, and get closer to training camp where, where teams would likely panic and, and that number would increase a little bit. To me, that would be the only thing that is keeping him from signing anywhere right now, specifically with the Seahawks. Yeah, That's it's very, tough. Very good point. Well, and, and the nice thing for him is that if he waits and waits and it doesn't happen, there comes a point for him where he's like, okay, it's too, it, it, it may not be what I wanted. I wanted like eight to 10 million and it's only going to be two and a half or three, but it's either that or nothing. So I have got this fallback option with Seattle that I can take at any moment if it doesn't look like, you know, this um, injury, like um, desperation from another team is going to get him a payday. That's a great point. Yeah. So he has this in his back pocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's, um, yeah. let's get back to your, uh, the sports on tap stuff. So talk to me about the different podcasts you do and why you do them like sammy you've got your own thing going and george you've got a little something going on the side and mm-hmm. some some are longer than others and, and you know and, and others you've kind of it looks like uh, you've stopped a little bit mm-hmm. are what is the future of like your show and you, i know that you guys like to do the, the youtube stuff and we we like to put out our stuff on youtube as well what do you think of the platform itself for communicating sports and 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 how do you guys kind of blend that? Because you guys also just do kind of culture type shows and, and yeah. shows that aren't affiliated with sports at all. So where's where's that going for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it's going right now. I think our main focus, our number one focus, at least, is the podcast between me and Sammy, the pod that with the Jorjur brothers. So I think that's our main, main, main focus. But on the side, we're trying to do other things and trying to start a little bit more evergreen content, content that will last, you know, whether you listen to it today or you listen to it seven months from now, I'm in the process of building out a new evergreen show, which has to do with travel and sports at the same time. Uh, I've been kind of doing the digital nomad thing for a year now, and I'll be getting back on the road here maybe in a few months where I'm traveling in different countries, visiting different bars, going to different sporting events. And I want to do something with that where I, you know, highlight the trip, highlight what that country's like, what that city's like, and try to find an influencer or a famous person in that area to tell the story about the country and what it's like to either live there, visit there and stuff. So it's a travel sports podcast. That would be awesome. Yeah. So that I'm in the process of working on that season one right now, actually. Uh, I spent some time in 
Colombia um, last year from October through December, and I was in Mexico from August through and before that for a few months. So, what in sports wasn't going on during then, uh, as far as live events. So, I actually spent most of the NFL season checking out different bars in different cities around uh, South America, and it was really weird to see, like, you know fans watching football in Medellin, Colombia, right? It's like, I actually saw Seahawk fans there during the uh, Thursday night game against the Cardinals, which is like so cool. And so stuff like that is for us. So we're trying to keep me and Sammy's podcast really focused on the now, what's going on today in sports and culture, and then using other podcasts to build evergreen content. So Bill, if you listen to it or keep you listen to it today, or you listen to it six months from now, it's still relevant to you. So yeah. talk to me, you don't, and you guys don't have to talk about this or reveal as much or as little as you want, but when you talk about monetizing podcasts and figuring out a way to create a sustainable model to um, be able to continue to produce original content and really have these deep, meaningful conversations that you want to have that go a little deeper than, than, the, the, than the websites that are just putting out content to put out content every day, right. you know, clicks, clicks, clicks. You guys are really trying to cut through that a little bit and go just that little extra level. Um, how does, how do you keep and, and retract and attain listeners to that and, and stay relevant? Yeah. I'll, I'll, let's say we go after this, but I mean, we, we do both, right? I mean, I guess we have our business model is, obviously just like any website clicks 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 for now but we're hoping that you know we make the money we make out of clicks and the money we make out of ad revenue can go into finding a very sustainable model for podcasting because everyone's trying to figure that out right now the podcast is the wild wild west i would say right now and uh very few and far between companies have figured out how to make it big in podcasting yeah and i think that's the uh that I, I would say that's the reason behind trying to diversify what we're doing a lot is there's a lot, I think, in this world right now, in the digital world and podcasting world and website world where you're kind of doing a lot of testing and a lot of figuring out what works, especially for your, your niche or just for you in general. Um, and I think that goes to, to like show with our company a little bit is we have a lot of interests and we're trying to, you know, almost see what a lot, what interests really can benefit us the most, which ones are we enjoying doing, which ones do we not enjoy and finding a way to kind of make them all work. And I think as George stated in the beginning of this is we want to be able to build something off of like a city's like off of the cities, we'll have our Seattle base, our Chicago base, uh, hopefully down the line, we'll have a New York, uh, LA, a Phoenix, whatever it may be, and kind of hit some of these central bases for people that are really passionate within their sports um, in those areas. And then, then those people who are fans of that can kind of explore the sports on tap and they might find a travel, uh, travel podcast that they enjoy. They might find a daily sports show that they're going to enjoy. And they might find that, you know what, I like to listen to a mix of that. And we have our podcast that's, you know, has some pop culture, has some just daily like we said, what people talk about in the bar, right? And so I think right now, the ultimate goal is to be testing all these avenues and try to make it work as best as possible while keeping like the brand equity or keeping the brand genuine. Because as George said, we still do put these things on our site, right? We, we put out content and still put it on our site, hoping for SEO and hoping to get some clicks. But at the same time, we've been trying to tie all those articles back to a, con a piece of content that we've produced. So unlike maybe a website that's just putting out uh, articles for click and regurgitating the news, we would put out that same article, but it'd be there'll be a tweet inside that or a YouTube clip of something that we produced content off, talked about. So you're clicking on a piece that you might see a lot of websites talking about, but within our article, there still is something laced back to us in our podcast or some piece of social media or some so that, graphic that we've made. That speaks to like the, the brand is really important to you. Yeah. What, what is your brand? 
Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to go back to saying uh, the internet's pub. And I think it's going to be, I think we, me and George talk about this a lot. We want to be the internet's pub for those sports fans that aren't quite necessarily, there's two sides to this. We're trying to find the middle. We don't want to be ESPN. We're not trying to just be a news site and, you know, go up daily and tell you the scores of a game and tell you the news. We also are not trying to go deep down a level towards like a bar stool where we're, you know, it's a frat kind of fratty. And I, I mean, I, I follow content from both companies. I'm not saying anything they're doing is wrong, but bar stool has a lot of frat and a lot of, um, whatever, maybe a different target audience that we're looking for. And we're trying to find something in the middle level that you guys want to avoid. It sounds like. Yeah. And that, that's, that's exactly. And we're trying to find that we're, we're feeling like there's maybe that missing, uh, in between for everybody, right? right? Whether I you're think- in college, whether you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, that you enjoy a little bit of the pop culture and you enjoy a little bit of maybe a little bit of goofier topics once in a while, but you also enjoy a casual sports conversation rather than either being overly analytical and overly, you know, news oriented or being uh, at some point with like a company like Barstool, who I still follow. Uh, sometimes it's not even, there's not even sports at all. So, right. So, and Keith, jump in anytime you want. I had just one more question on, on the, the culture thing. And I found this to be the most interesting aspect of, of the potential conversation is that there's a surface level culture um, that, that's able to be talked about and readily discussed over multiple different platforms. And then there's a, a, a deeper conversation to be had on culture that permeates through sports, but also hits many major other touch points in a, in a society and, and leads to a, a deeper conversation in a community or in, in among a fan base or amongst players and issues that are important to players. Are you guys, uh, do you typically try to avoid those sorts of things or do you really envision yourself kind of tapping into that level as well? Um, that's a great, great, great question, actually. And I guess for us, we try to stay, the best way to say it, as authentic as possible. Um, there's a lot of things in the culture where, you know, and we're living in a society right now that's very, very uh, volatile, right? Like it's like bubbling, it's ready to burst. And there are some topics where, you know, everyone feels like they have to be only one way on it. And if we don't feel like we are that leaning that exact way, we have to be honest. You know, I think people can see through being fake. I think people can see through if you're bullshitting them, really. So we try to be as authentic as possible as far as the culture goes, because sometimes, yeah, let's say use LeBron James for an example, because he's kind of the lowest hanging fruit on this one, because he seems like he talks the most about all this stuff. And it's like, okay, 90% of the stuff LeBron James says about culture or what's going on in this world or what's going on in the country or what's going on in politics might be really relevant and really informative, but there's a 10% that's not. So I try, we try to treat everything as authentic as possible. If you say something, if we feel like a player is pushing politics too much, we might say, hey, we're not saying don't have a political opinion, but know that your platform is really powerful. Your platform is influencing children. And so you have to be really informed with what you say. So we try to be as fair as possible and keep the conversation as honest as possible. So no, because we don't want anyone to say, hey, man, we have friends who listen to the podcast. We have our family who listens to the podcast. They know who we are. And we don't want anyone to come out and say, you guys aren't being authentic with your opinions. Yeah. And I think one big thing on that is if, if it's something that we also, we don't feel like we have to touch on every topic. Um, yes. Which is an important key here, which I, like George said, the world's very, I would say, I don't know. I don't know what the right word is. I was going to say fragile, but like everything you say is if it's very like, you know, you can be told off for saying one word wrong or one, whatever it is. If I don't feel comfortable talking about something too, my authentic self would be like, I don't talk about that. That's just me. Right. And I, 
I feel like one thing that's a little different, I feel like uh, media in general, like I'd consider all of us media, we're all making some sort of media. And I think media thinks they have to touch on everything. Yes. Like, oh my gosh, this happened. Like, I have to make a statement about this. And I'm like, I don't think I do. I don't know if I, like when, when there's just certain things that people think they have to talk about. I don't know if I have to talk about that because if I don't feel like I have a genuine opinion on it, why should I be trying to formulate True. this magical thing to make people yeah. feel better that well, oh, he spoke about it? What do you think it? about the, the way that you're perceived, you know, because you've created a brand, you're continuing to create that brand. And over time, maybe folks expect you to have an opinion on something. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you, would you think that you would feel that pressure? To, um, to make make a stand on something, even if you it forced you to think about it first, you know maybe you didn't uh, have something a, going into it. That's such a deep and good question. Like, I, I love that question, and I would say if I was forced to, like, if someone you know, it's like, I really need your opinion on it, I'd be like, what? why me that <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> like that would be mine like there's so much information out there and people who are really really well versed in the topics that are really really sensitive or um that are really really important and i would ask why me i would not not give an opinion if i had one but i just sometimes wonder why do we go to sports people for opinions on really really high end level questions like, for example, Stephen A. Smith, right? He He's fun. He's on ESPN. He's doing all this stuff. And then we really need his opinion on the presidential election. Not really, to be honest with you. I, But people feel like they're obligated to give that opinion. And I would just ask someone, why would you want my opinion on such a deep, deep subject? Well, I think one of the things that's missing in 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 that is that as you build up a following and um, you know your own personal brand, people will come to respect mm -hmm. what you say, what you think, and they're going to be looking for all right. So this is, you know, th th there's an edge here, and we, you know, sh which way? And they're going to look to the people that they respect, whose opinions that they, um, even if they don't disagree they agree with them, but they mm -hmm. still value them, um, and they're going to be like, all right, I, I. I just want to know because I respect this guy's opinion on, on a lot of stuff. And I think that it does get to be uh, a challenge. Uh, like Bill mm, and I have, have had this discussion where we're like, do we want to bring this into our show? And for a lot of us, it's like, no, we don't, we're just, you know, we're a CX. Let's, let's just stay there. And then there are certain times when things happen and we're like, I'm the sorry. The gravity of the situation requires you to be honest. Mm. Yeah, we. Yeah. I, I I can't not talk about about it. Um, our show immediately following the uh, January sixth, um, you know, attack on the Capitol. I, mm. I couldn't not talk about it. Do I have anything to say that's unique or um, really like it's gonna you know I don't know change someone's opinion or whatever? No, I I, I don't. But I mm. personally needed an avenue to talk about it and discuss yeah. it, with Bill and. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, so there, the, the, it is, it is one of those things where when you have these non-sports things that especially in our polarized nation right now, there is the uh, word we were looking for polarized. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that true. It, you want to avoid because you're, you know, you're just building a brand. You're just, you know, trying to attract people. But at the same time, there are other things that if you feel strongly about it, you just kind of have to. And I like, right. I like Sammy's part about, uh, you know, just be authentic. If that's, you're not taking a side because it's, what you think people want or whatever. It's like, you know what, this is what I believe. And I, I get that people are going to disagree with me. Like I'm, yeah. I think you just kind of have to go down that. In, You're in never going to find a hundred percent of people to ever agree with you on anything. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, no matter what you say, right. There's going to be one side that's going to come at you and say you're wrong. And like, I, I I've never gone, I've never seen a Twitter conversation go with, here's my opinion. Well, you're wrong. No, this is why I'm right. Oh, wow. You changed my mind. 
<laughs> like it's yeah. never happened before in the history of Twitter. Like, yeah. So, so <laughs> it's so, not yeah. how Twitter works. <laughs> no, it's not how it works. And that's how most people have an opinion already and they're not changing it unless they're really, really open-minded and ready to have a deep conversation and are, are mentally ready to change their opinions. And it's weird. Like some, sometimes I like one of the things that, you know, I was looking at the other day and it's just, you wonder, you know, we're the U. I don't know if you guys watched the USA Mexico uh, match the other night. And at the end of the match, you know, the fans were throwing beers and it hit a Mexican player in in the head. And everyone on social media is like, "That's so funny!" Ha 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 ha. And That's then, not funny. That was and it's not dangerous. funny. But then, when when they threw popcorn at Russell Wilson, every uh, Russell Wilson, Russell Westbrook during the playoff game, everyone's outraged. And it's like, which one is it? when you like mm -hmm. it's weird to me that people pick and choose what they want to be outraged on mm -hmm. and what they want to find funny on the same exact situation and i mean this I, is why i do not speak on anything unless i feel <laughs> like it's passionate i'm passionate about it right because mm -hmm. at the end of the day also 100% of the world's not on Twitter, right? So right, true. most people, I mean, even let, let's go as simple as like election time, right? If you go on Twitter, you would think Donald Trump would lose the election 99% to one if you went on Twitter, right? For example, and that's not the reality of the world. Like Twitter is not the only place in the world. You might go on Twitter and 99% of Twitter says this, whatever it is. And Outside in the real world, there's a lot of people that don't have Twitter or don't have don't yeah. go on Instagram. In their opinions, it just are doesn't completely matter different. to to most people. Most people, yes, you know, avoid those things. Most people aren't watching cable news night after night after night and, yeah. and getting opinions and all that. People have lives. They go on. And they do their stuff. That's why they come yeah. and let's do our shows as well. It's like they don't want to deal with that sort of stuff. They want to kind of get into what they really love and, and what yeah. they like and they avoid yeah. things that they don't like and don't love. So, yeah. So I will make, go can ahead. I make one more small point? My one more small point on this would be at the end of the day, just like I, I would prefer, and there's a reason I have one of my side podcasts on myself called stuff that matters with Sammy George where, and I, I literally named it like named it that because I go on that podcast and talk about stuff that matters to me. And uh, th and I tend to be a person that likes to lean on positive news and journeys of players talking about their mental health and people talking about the good things that are happening in the world. And so that's why I also personally like to stay out of extremely like tough conversations, because if I don't have that passion for it, I'm putting myself maybe in a bad position if I if I go in and I'm like, I got to speak on politics day, like, like, like Stephen A. Smith was, you know, talking about the presidential election. Like, I'm not sure if I'm not passionate enough. I like to stick to the, the good side of news because I also think one thing that we're missing in this industry, and I'm hoping to get out of my podcast and hopefully the sports on tap in general can, can feed this into like the sports world or into any type of news outlet is maybe getting some more good news out there because I, I, I tend to think that, bad news is what dominates the the, the headlines the in, narrative yep. online and, and on cable TV. So let's, I try to, I'm trying to get more, some more good news out there. Actually. And that, that, um, you know, people um, hunger for it. If you look at some of the data, because like uh, the guy from the office, when the pandemic started and all you hear heard was all this negative stuff, he started a, a YouTube show, um, SGN, right? Some good yep. news. And it just got insane views uh, because yeah. people were hungry for, you know, something good. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I think that's, I think that is a, gr a great way to, to approach it. And there's, there are things like in the world of sports, these athletes go out and they play and, 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 you know, they perform and all that, but that's not just who they are. Um, almost all of them are a part of some organization. They have a foundation or they work with another foundation and they they, they spend their off seasons helping other people. They advocate yeah. um, for people. Yeah. And, and those stories are rarely told. Uh, I, I got to go and, um, you know, be press for the Richard Sherman softball game um, a few years ago. And like, there were guys that were, you know, they were there and it was like, okay, we're going to go talk to someone. And they wanted to tell their story. They wanted to say, Hey, this is why we're here. This is why it's important. 
And there was nobody asking those questions. Yeah. They're so, like, can you ask about my charity? Yeah, not about exactly. like what's happening this off season with, yeah, actually, with OTAs. They, they literally were asking that they were like, you know, Hey, I really want to talk about, you know, um, all this stuff that, you know, th- that I, I am here with, with, with Richard because he's doing this. Let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. And all the questions from the other people that were there were like, ah, oh, so what's your opinion on, on, you know, this draft pick or whatever. And they're just like, that's not what we were here for. Um, yeah. And it, I was, I was always kind of amazed at, at, at they want to talk about it. And I think people would want to want to read about it. I think people would want to hear about it. Uh, so yeah, go f- like, I, I love that approach. So let's get back to the conversation on football since, you know, people are here to, uh, to want to talk about some Seahawks stuff. So let's talk about um, the, the new additions on the team that you guys think are, are relevant. What do you think, Sammy, on the, the three draft picks in particular? How they fit, uh, how they integrate? Did we, did, we do, did we have the right strategy in staying at, at, with our first pick in the second round or as opposed to, you know, trading back a little bit, picking up some draft capital or trying to figure out another way to generate, you know, more out of the draft. Yeah. I, I thought, you know, I've been a big, what's the right way to put it? The Seahawks win a lot. So they're not drafted in the top 15. Right. And you don't tend it's, it, it's what we did a few years back or whatever, when we first won our first Super Bowl. It's pretty rare to have that many low draft picks kind of come to become these amazing talents. So do I wish the Seahawks found a way to maybe snag some more draft picks? Yes, in some sense. But in in another world, I'm kind of thinking it was okay. You know, like we really did sure up. We, you know, we got a tight end. We got Gabe Jackson. You know, we gave up some draft picks for last year for Jamal Adams. We got Carlos Dunlap. I think we got more value in giving away draft picks and using that capital to pick up productive players. Now, especially in a world where you already have your quarterback, you have a lot of your main pieces on the team. Now, if you were rebuilding, you know, like I, I would, I would maybe think differently. If we're rebuilding, I would say we need to get draft picks, draft picks, draft picks. But I'm kind of fine where we were at. Now, I, I guess my only concern here would be, and I could be totally wrong about this, of course, but you know, the Dwayne Eskridge pick, I don't necessarily know if we needed to draft a wide receiver. I know we were slimmer on the roster, but I feel like that's something we probably could have figured out in a very cheap way in the offseason. But it could work out great. It's going to be a lot of speed, and it's exciting. Um, Can't go I wrong with do, speed, huh? Yeah, a lot I, loved, of speed. I loved, loved, loved that pick. <laughs> I like it, but at the same time, I'm just one of those guys, though. If it was me, if I was, I, I could be wrong. Would reason, you be on, on the Julio GM. Jones deal after Eskridge as well? So they disagree with you. Yeah. They picked not only picked Eskridge, but they were deep into a conversation about Julio Jones as well. That's what I know. That's what scared me. But I, I'm just one of those guys that I would have loved if the Seahawks could just go out with their three draft picks. And this could be an awful idea. I'm not an NFL GM, but go get three offensive linemen. If one more of them pans out, get oh, one Keith, more of them pans Keith out. All of a sudden we have, yeah. maybe have a great O line. <laughs> See, yeah. Um, there are people are, are, our regular listen, listeners are going to think I planted that comment. Cause uh, <laughs> um, I've had this plan for a while too. I said, go use five draft picks, get five offensive linemen. If one or two of them yeah, pan out, solve the, mm-hmm. solve the freaking team. problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the offense and defensive line. That's, that's where I would, um, uh, that's where I would go. But so uh, there, there's a little bit of debate about the, the cornerback that they picked up because they needed a cornerback. They still need a cornerback yeah, in my opinion. Still, yeah. um, and they went and got a guy who doesn't fit any of their profiles. He doesn't have the length. He doesn't have, you know, any of that. Um, and he also commits penalties on almost every play. Um, if you look at all the, we don't hand, need that. <laughs> all the handsy, you know, grabbing and stuff that, that he did. He's taught to do that, um, Keith. Come on. It, it he, he did say that it, it's on his tape. It's there every play and it, it's not a penalty in college, but it is in the NFL. I think um, though that your, so, your larger point though is, is well taken is that nobody really predicted Trey Brown. Like when we were all thinking maybe cornerback would be a, a one of those picks. And I think all of us were thinking it was probably a guy that was, 
you know, had had the length, the size, the a speed. Six three guy, not a five nine guy. Well, yeah, isn't we're it weird? To. Like the whole entire NFL, like well, the the Seahawks started the trend of let's get these sure. big corners, let's get these long corners, and then the whole entire NFL is like, yeah, let's get these long corners, let's get these big corners, and then the Seahawks are like, all right, let's draft this little dude. Yeah, and <laughs> like, and look what you know we had success last year with uh, DJ Reed. Yeah, yeah, so I, I mean, I kind of trust Schneider and uh, Carroll when it comes to cornerbacks. Uh, they've done a really good job drafting them. They've done a good job developing them. So I kind of just like, I just say, hey, I, I trust them. Yeah, I'm. I was there. That's nice. um, <laughs> it, 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 I was going to say that 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 I wonder if how much of that was Chris Richard because he was such a good teacher for defensive yeah, backs true. and they haven't really developed anybody since he left. Got to admit you're right. Griffin yeah, yeah. was a disappointment. So, I'll have to say he, so, he, I mean, he started a, a pretty strong campaign and then he just completely leveled off. And I thought it never really improved in those last three years. Yeah. So, um, and you know, Trey flowers looked, looked better as a rookie than he has in any of the years since. Um, and so I, <laughs> I worry that, you know, I, I think they can identify the talent, like no problem. I mean, they're both great at it. I mean, you can just look at like the Richard Shermans and, and, you know, those picks, um, you know, Byron Maxwell didn't even play much on defense. He was a special teams player in college yeah. uh, and they turned him into a, a really good corner who got, got a huge payday. Um, so I, I, I think they can identify the talent, but who's developing it. I'm, I'm, I, I'm concerned about just being like, okay, we can go get guys uh, and develop yeah, them. Yeah, that's true. Because Chris Richard was such a big piece of that, and I miss having him here. That's a great point. I don't, actually. I don't miss him being defensive coordinator. I miss him teaching our, our quarterbacks. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go around and let's just talk about a, a few guys that each of you want to talk about. Um, who do you think is going to have an impact on the roster and, and, and why George, what do you think? All right. Well, I got two undrafted rookies that I just like been kind of reading about and I'm really just interested in both of them. So these guys, we can look back at this in, in a year and be like, man, George nailed it. Or he'd be like, these guys aren't even on the damn team. So that's, what's fun about undrafted rookies, but I like BJ Emmons from Florida Atlantic. Um, you got a guy who started off at Alabama and when you go to Alabama, you know what can happen there. You can get lost. You cannot play. He got injured, had to go to a community college, and then he went to Florida Atlantic and played really well. Um, so one of a guy who got recruited to Alabama, to me, is always like, okay, this guy can obviously play some football. So that's one guy I'm looking at. Another guy is uh, Tamorian Terry from Florida State, who – you know, he's a big dude, six foot three, and he was top 10 in receiving yards in FSU history and 13th in touchdowns in FSU history. And last year he had a 49 uh, yard per touchdown reception. So like the guy, pro the guy probably has some speed. He's big. He doesn't probably and have it, dude. He's yeah, got he it. he, he yeah. got some speed a little <laughs> faster than me. I, I run about six two forty. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so those two guys are just two guys of, you know, you read the, the tail of the tape you wonder like could it, uh, there's always an undrafted rookie free agent that does well in the nfl we saw the J james robinson last year at jacksonville who was a key guy for them at the running back position could bj emmons come in being an alabama product a guy who didn't have to put too many miles in college because he got hurt and didn't have to take the SEC beating because he had to transfer to Florida Atlantic. So he's not getting hit by SEC guys for four years. Could he come in and make an impact? Yeah, absolutely. Sammy. Well, I would love to be able to uh, say his name, but I'm not, I'm not sure how to exactly say it. But Witherspoon. Yeah, <laughs> and Akello. Akello. Yeah. Akello is what, okay, that's what I thought. Akello Witherspoon. Um, simply because I also like his confidence. Um, I know he, he, he's formally stated that he's been the best corner in the league over the last four years when he's not hurt. Um, I, I, but I don't know how accurate that is. I don't think it's very accurate, but I enjoy the, <laughs> I enjoy the confidence. <laughs> I appreciate that. He called Russ, uh, Richard Sherman before joining the Seahawks and Sherman kind of gave him a thumbs up and told him that he'd be a great fit. Um, and I know that there's a glaring hole for the Seahawks at corner. And if he can produce a, an ounce of 
you know, being the best corner in the league, <laughs> if he can produce an ounce of good talent and, and be good for the Seahawks, it can really change our defense. I, I think even with the Shaquille Griffin, we had some glaring holes at corner. Um, and I think that if we can, you know, hit on a guy like this, who, you know, he was, I mean, he was productive when he plays. And I think he is, I think he's a really good cornerback when, when healthy, I, I know he's not actually the best corner in the league, but if he can be healthy, I think we got really lucky. Um, I think we just got really lucky. What do you think about a cornerback room I mean, that has Trey Brown, DJ Reed, Akella Witherspoon, and Trey Flowers? Is that going to intimidate anybody? No, uh, but <laughs> I don't think it's going to be Our very fans. intimidating. But I, I, I yeah, I think. <laughs> I think it could be surprisingly okay. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I don't think it's going to well, I don't and something think it's gonna I, install fear on any teams. Something I talked about with Keith last week was something that might make it okay is the fact that we got really good on the defensive line. Yeah, and, yes. and that mm-hmm. pass rush increase and, and pressure may make the back end not so susceptible to getting thrown over the top and all that kind of stuff that defensive uh, getting carlos dunlap simply last year i mean i think we went from like 30th in sacks to uh to like top eight or top nine i believe it was after i mean jamal adams had come back dunlap and now we got carrie Hyder. um even guy like darrell taylor coming in this year supposedly gonna actually play there is Mm -hmm. a lot to what you just said and i think there is a lot to the fact that could have could our like corners have looked extra bad because of that reason last year, especially in the beginning half of the season. Yes. And could they surprisingly be a decent group if you have a good pass rush? I think the answer is also yes. So I, that's why I think Witherspoon's a really big piece here. If he can be an above average or at least average corner with a good pass rush, I think the I think think we can be okay and as much as trey flowers gets hated on and i also don't love watching trey flowers i know he made some good strides last year and got better um i think i still just imagine him getting burnt in green bay two years ago in playoffs and i see all those negatives but i think we have a lot of potential for guys to get better and with the defensive line like you're saying i think there's a potential for them to go from being a below average to at least average group and if they're average and we got two good safeties and we got a great linebacking core and a great defensive line. I, you, you probably, you're not going to be good at every single spot. So you'll yeah. probably be okay. No, I think, it, you know, if you really look at a, de- uh, a Pete Carroll defense, it's really designed to work off everyone else being in the right spot in positions to be successful in their own and in, in, in their own assignments. And if ever, if somebody's off a little bit or somebody's hedging, you know, to one side, just by a step that can affect. So for me, like integrating a Jamal Adams into the defense and having him be blitz heavy for, for a considerable amount of time, at least in the first eight games makes a guy like Diggs, like take a step over to, to, to Adams part of the field, which exposes a, a Griffin a little bit, you know, and Griffin struggled with, you know, some over the top coverage, I think because of that. And when everyone came back after injury and Dunlap came back, I think the defense finally settled in to where they could trust each other. And um, I really do believe that that was, that was key. Keith, what do you think? Um, maybe a guy or two that you're, you've got your eye on. Well, I mean, okay. As far as someone who's, as far as people who are going to make an impact uh, this year, um, this guy, I, I don't, I hope he doesn't because he, we don't want him playing right away. But as a guy that I hope makes an impact long term would be Forsyth, the the tackle that they drafted, um, because he his footwork, his um, he's got really quick feet, especially for a guy his size, and not just for a guy his size. He's got really quick feet, which means he can get to the speed rushers. His kick step technique is 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 solid. Um, but he needs to get he needs to learn how to use his leverage and and, and do things in the running game. Um, I think he's got the talent to be left tackle of the future um, when Dwayne Brown finally moves on. But he's they don't if he's playing a lot this year, it's because somebody got hurt, and I think they're in trouble. 
Um, he needs more development time. Um, but I think given the development time, he could be really good. So I'm very interested to watch him when camp starts and, and, uh, and going forward with that, but you knew I was going to pick the offensive lineman, didn't you, Bill? No, uh, <laughs> pretty much. So who's another guy? Um, I really want to see what they've got in Hater because he's the guy's generated stats and sacks. I think he had eight and a half last year, but his he has, he's got the reputation not of a guy who creates pressure, but a guy who cleans things up after other people create pressure. And mm-hmm. I, I mean that's useful too. But um, is he actually going to be a a guy that that helps this defense, um, you know, be stronger, or does he just compile stats and you know uh, ends up looking more like um, L.J. Collier but older? Uh, you know what I mean? Like he he doesn't mm-hmm. he's he's just a stat compiler and not really a guy that makes the impact that his stack total would suggest that he does. Um, so I'm I'm very intrigued as to what they've got with him. I think he they need someone to clean up those sacks anyways, mm-hmm. way too many where they get close and then they escape and throw the bit, you know, the big play. And if you have someone who can clean up the mess and get that quarterback to the ground, like that, they need that. So, right. so we'll I'm, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to throw out four names, but I'm going to let you guys talk about them. Mm-hmm. So uh, you mentioned uh, this guy earlier, George, um, Gerald Everett, mm-hmm. DK Medcalf. And I want to talk about, like what Eskridge brings in to allow DK Metcalf, maybe to, in Shane Waldron's kind of thing, what effect that might have. And on the defensive side, the potential of Alden Smith, we don't know the status yet for sure. And we've been kind of hesitant to talk about him a little bit, but I, if you added him to the mix, what might that do? And then Daryl Taylor, like it's essentially his rookie year and a guy like that coming in who according to Pete Carroll, it sounds like he's going to have an opportunity to possibly start at strong side linebacker and come up and rush the passer on passing downs. Just overall, what what are your thoughts on those four players and the impact that they might have? Yeah. um, I guess I'll start with Eskridge because I I was really excited about that draft pick in general. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we got Tyler Lockett in the second round. Yeah. I think that we moved up for Tyler Lockett. Second, we got DK Metcalf in the second round as well. And now we're getting Eskridge here in the second round, and we've been able to hit on wide receivers really well here in the second round of NFL drafts. And I like that because you have him on a cheap contract. That's kind of why I was against the Julio Jones thing. I felt like we had enough weapons already, and now we have Eskridge. Who's going to be? He's a speedster, right? I mean, we have DK Metcalf, who we all know the potential there and how fun it is to watch. He's going to stress stretch the field. You're going to have. Um, Falk is stretching the field, and I think we're going to be using Eskridge in fun situations because he's so fast. We're going to get him the ball, try to get him the ball in space, and let him do things. Yep, and that's the key, and let him do things that are fun. He's going to be a weapon, and I mean, I like I said, I've never been a guy who likes to overpay for these weapons, but when you can get one in a rookie deal in the second round, sign me up every single time, and let's see what we can do. Is he going to be a guy that's used like Tavon Austin was used uh, for a while. What's what's he gonna really be? Is he like a even like a Reggie Bush when he was on New Orleans? He never really played running back. He's just get a guy in space, see what he can do. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, and that's a guy I'm looking forward to watching a lot. Yeah, I think the one piece there too is also Jill Everett with that receiving core type of deals because. Obviously, he's tight end, but he—I think he's gonna be used a lot with a guy like Russell Wilson, <laughs> with the escaping. It there's a lot of opportunities where a tight end comes off of a block or is mm-hmm. or just finds himself in the middle of the field with Russell Wilson running to the right and you know throwing a little. You would have thought that, that would have come into play, you know, over the last several seasons, but it seems like we've underutilized a the middle of the field and be the tight end group for, for quite a while. Does Shane Waldron completely change that equation? I think he will. And I think a guy like Gerald Everett changes that equation too, just because I think we're going to have somebody that obviously knock on wood, but is consistently there at the tight end position. And with somebody like Shane Waldron and they're talking about more tempo, I, I think you have to incorporate the tight end a lot. I mean, I think it's, it's big for any team. And I think that's been kind of a 
hard place for Russell Wilson recently is every year, different tight ends, people getting hurt, trying. We tried Greg Olson with Hollister, with Disley, with Jimmy Graham before, and just haven't really had that consistency. So I think we're going to hopefully have a guy that's there playing snaps consistently and a lot of them. And, and Russell Wilson's going to love that with the addition of like George is saying speed from Eskridge size from DK Metcalf, some, a little bit of in between with Tyler Lockett, just an overall guy. I think we have like those dynamic pieces all together, right? You got like the DK Metcalf, the, just the beast receiver. You got the, Eskridge who's speedy and I think Lockett was somewhere in between and then you add a tight end you add Chris Carson coming back and talk you know, about uh, talk pieces. about Rashad it's Penny for a half a second because he always seems to get completely left out of the conversation I'm interesting to find out like from you guys what do you think of the Rashad Penny situation and can he have a legitimate chance to have a real impact if he can stay healthy I, I I, I think yes, but I'm just, it's so unfortunate with this running back group, the, the lack of times we've got to see those two guys healthy, just mm-hmm. yeah, game week after week, Carson with Penny. Um, Cause I think it would work out really great. We've seen it with a lot of teams recently. I feel like there, most teams do not have a Derrick Henry where you have one running back that gets all the carries no. and just goes downhill. It's a lot of mix and match with running backs these days. And I think, we have the potential to have this great duo, um, but they're never, uh, neither one of them, I feel like should be your every down back. Um, and the, uh, Carson probably obviously a little more, but neither, uh, neither one of them, you know, is going to be the bell cow and have 35 carries. So we, I feel like in order to see the best out of both of them, I feel like we need both healthy at the same time. And unfortunately I, I'm just at the point where I don't know if I truly believe Penny's going to be healthy for a full year. You know, there's just some guys that have the injury bug and there's always that nagging injury and it's unfortunate. It's just unfortunate too, because he didn't before he, you know, came into the NFL. He was, that's why they picked him over Nick Chubb is he had the medical check and uh, he passed with flying colors. So, yeah. And so he, yeah, he was very durable. I wonder, uh, I mean, and Chubb's knee was, was, you know, a red flag for a lot of teams, but I wonder if um, they maybe have looked at that kind of the wrong way. And uh, Penny had so many carries in college that he took quite a beating and, you know, with running back, it's not, we always say, Oh, you know, running backs are done at 29 or maybe 30, right? Like, like that's kind of the cutoff, but I've seen um, a study done where it's, it's more number of carries than number of years. And he had what 300, 300 average uh, carries per year, I believe. Yeah. So a lot of his, Yikes. a lot of his, um, a lot of the mileage on him came in the college level and now he's, you know, f- you know, feeling that. So um, I, that's my concern. I do think he's a great fit for this offense. He's um, that, you know, outside zone with that, the the Rams ran um, uh, more than the inside zone, which the Seahawks uh, did in the past uh, is a great fit for him and his speed, can be a difference maker. I just got to, he's got to stay healthy. Um, He's got to get on the field and stay there. This, this, this might be his last chance here. Mm -hmm. I mean, he might be, he's he's not getting a fifth year option. No, he might, he might be a guy who, and I hope he does well here because I actually like him a lot and I see the potential. I see um, what he can do. But the, he might be a guy who just needs a change of scenery. <laughs> he really might be. He might go somewhere else and stay healthy or do better. I just feel like he's a little bit snake bitten right now. And it's unfortunate. And it's not his fault. I mean, it's no one's fault when you're getting freak injuries left and right. So I, I hope he does well because, I mean, there's just another weapon for us. And you root for guys who have. I mean, you root for everyone on the team, right? But you do Don't root a little person. extra. Yeah. yeah, you do root a little extra for someone like Penny. How about somebody like top. Taylor on defense? What are your expectations? Yep. What do you think? I mean, if he successfully comes back from that, what kind of an effect could he have on the defense, Sammy? I mean, I think he can have a, a huge effect. I mean, it's it's the he's a type of guy that can you know kind of change the equation for us. And like we were saying, you know, can it's. It, it's the more pressure we're getting on quarterbacks and the better that that part of our defense is, the more we're going to be hiding that corner back group. And I think Taylor could have a huge effect. I, I, 
I'm just, I don't know. It, it obviously is, it's a hard situation because we don't know what's going to come out of it. I, th- I think they said he is supposedly fully ready, going to be a mm-hmm. full go this year, right? But I, I what is what does that mean? And like what do like what happened last year as well? Does anybody well, it's do hard we too know because we've full- never even seen him in a training camp, I and mean, we didn't have yeah. any yeah. idea, right? And all of a sudden, this guy's yeah, supposed no. to come in and be all world. Now, I did go back and look at some film here this week on Daryl Taylor, just a little cut up highlight thing. And there's a lot to be excited about. I mean, the guy plays the run really well, so he can set the edge. And he's very effective and just overpowering guys. He looks like um, he looks like Clark, you know? Um, yeah. And he's just kind of, he moves that way and he's kind of throws people around and stuff. And I, it, it's kind of an exciting prospect to think about his effect. Um, but I have zero expectations. Like, yeah, it's hard to I have expectations. That's the thing. Yeah. You just have zero expectations and you're just all hopeful for the, for the, for the upside. Um, yeah. And he ha- he has that mix, which is interesting. I know that they're saying he's going to be listed as a defensive end, but they're going to work him with like strong side linebackers and, see uh, you know he drops back into coverage yeah and see what kind of because he did do a lot of drop back in college i guess and and that's where it's if for some reason it does work out the way we're envisioning yeah it could be a, a game changer on the seahawks defense um and if it unfortunately fails though it could also be a pretty huge missed opportunity for us because like what I'm envisioning, if it works, you know, you're talking about a different level on, on for the Seahawks on defense compared to if it not, if it doesn't work, um, we're probably still having, a, you know, a little bit of a glaring hole in some spots again. And I, I know the pass well, rush is fine. It would have pointed but, to the fact that they've just missed. They've just yeah. missed on their last four defensive ends if Daryl Taylor doesn't work out. So Jesus, uh, uh, last question football related question then we'll wrap this thing up so did you were you guys aware that we signed robert kimdichi and if if so do you think that he has a a shot like i guess he nailed he killed his workout for the seahawks and they hired him on the spot like they offered him a contract before he left the building um what do you think about that uh well i mean it's a uh the seahawks did spend a lot of time this off season taking some of those risks, I guess, right? With guys like Witherspoon um, and Kendichi. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the hard thing with these guys is, I think George was saying it about Penny, right? Is like these guys that are maybe a little bit considered busts need a change of scenery. And um, I mean, well, he was a first round pick with the Cardinals, right? Yeah. So yeah. He's considered a, I mean, he's considered a bust. I mean, it, totally. that, that's a, <laughs> yep, that's a, a that's the de- de- definition of a bust. <laughs> yeah. And so it, it's but hard. You know, that you know, Sammy, that the, that the Seahawks and particularly Pete Carroll loves these kind of reclamation projects and he, and he, and they actually do a pretty decent job. And, and you could point to Alden Smith as being kind of another one in that sort of category where they, yep. they get these guys with a lot of upside and they just take a chance that their culture in, in that locker room is going to be enough to affect the bad behavior parts of what these guys are known for before they come into the building and allow them to that, allow that talent to kind of come to the front. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I, I admire Pete is that, that he's, he believes in second chances and stuff and, and yeah. more than 50% of the time, some of those things work out, you know? Um, yeah. And, so, and he, he likes taking those risks. I mean, even Bruce serving out of college, I know had that, yeah. What was he was selling, was using counterfeit money for something or what was it? Or doing something with drugs. I can't remember what it was. And Bruce Irving I think there's had a lot of things that was going on with him. Yeah. But <laughs> he it was, a he lot was in a very poor situation. And, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you had him take a risk there. We've obviously continued to take the risk on guys like Josh Gordon. Um, we've, we, I guess we've left and right been willing to try. I mean, even before Antonio Brown signed with the the Bucks, I know Seahawks were one of the main options and Russell Wilson himself kind of wanted to be, you know, be part of the trying to help him get back uh, to who he was. Yeah. So these yeah. these are things that the Seahawks do and you're right. They they do tend to make them work out a lot of the times, but it's one of those situations where there's no there's no He, he also has an right? equal part in, you know, getting cut before training camp's over. 
you know, mm-hmm. so yeah, you know. yeah, it's very possible. So let's end the conversation with you guys. So um, take me to, uh, you know, the next six months. Uh, what are George and Sammy up to and why should, why should folks be paying attention and what should they be paying attention to? Like, where, where are you? How can we find you? Where do they watch you? Um, what, what should they be looking for? Yeah. Sammy, you want to go, go ahead first? Yeah. I think a uh, big thing here, especially for Seahawks fans is while our main brand is the sports on tap and that can be found anywhere at the sports on tap.com or at the sports on tap on every platform. Um, we really are pushing podcasting side of things. Um, and our podcast is pod that with the George Rue brothers, and you can find it everywhere at pod that, um, on social media. And we do do a lot of Seattle leaning stuff. And I think we, like we discussed earlier in the podcast, George and I are planning on doing more daily live type of situations, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, whatever it is. And we do have a portion where we throw in a little Seattle spice at the end of every episode or every, every show, because we do have a little lean and a little bit of a Seattle bias when it comes to sports. And we want to, you know, emphasize that. So, um, you can, you can tune in to that on a daily basis or roughly a daily basis here coming soon. And, and, uh, you know, follow along with our brand and you'll find our Seattle brand in there and Chicago brand, if you're interested in other stuff too. And, uh, we're just going to be pushing podcasting, podcasting and personality and, <laughs> and trying to and, and YouTube as well. Be authentic. YouTube yeah. YouTube. Well. You can also find us there at youtube.com slash pod that as well. And that's where we'll, we'll be putting full episodes, a lot of different clips and um, uh, just social media in general. If you go to us at the sports on tap or at pod that on any platform, you'll find George and I's profiles. You'll find, um, all the different like affiliates that, that we have. And we're really trying to push that fan experience, like the internet's pub and what it's like. I, to have I tried a to write them all down in, out. in a long list and it got to be like about, you know, a college rule page long of at, yeah. at, 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 and I was just like, wow, I'm just, I'm yeah. just going to let you guys talk. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot. I, I always say, just go to the, at the sports on tap and you'll start finding everything there. It's kind of the yeah. best way to do it. Um, we're also, um, you know, if you're a fan of the Seahawks, which if you probably are, if you're listening to this podcast, um, we, we also started something called the Seahawks Chronicles, which is something you know, we're doing with evergreen content. We are two episodes in Sammy, three episodes in where two, the third one's coming this week. Yeah, where we're kind of going season up by season of Seattle Seahawks history and kind of recapping right. what happened in that season. So a little bit history book of the Seahawks. And what happened in one. Seattle that year and in the yeah. world. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, nice. yeah. So we're, that's what when we say we're trying to push some more evergreen content, that's kind of what we mean, because you can listen to that now or you can listen to that six years from now in 1978. Seahawks will still be relevant to you <laughs> and uh, nothing will change. So that, that'll be really fun. Um, as, I guess in our future here, I'm starting my uh, travel podcast. I'm working on season one right now. I'll be releasing them in seasons at 10 episodes, uh, probably once a year. Wow. And um, I think that is that is a legit future of podcasts right there is a um, is is releasing seasons like like a Netflix thing, because people can then binge that thing. And I think there's there's potential to have a little bit more. Yeah, it's something we're trying out new. Thank thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. And it's something we're trying out new here. And it's something I'm really passionate about. If people if anyone wants to ask, like, what's George really about? It's sports. Uh, sports and travel. I love culture. I love to travel. I love eating different food. And I try to combine the two into one fun thing that can people can follow along with. And then I also, uh, we're launching something next soccer season, which is Spurs on Taps podcast, which is Tottenham Hotspur, which believe it or not, Bill, here in Phoenix, Arizona, there's a Tottenham Hotspur bar that wow. also doubles as a Seattle Seahawks bar. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we'll, so <laughs> we'll have to figure that one out and we'll have to meet up there one day. Yeah, exactly. They say and some, they both play on Sundays. Usually the Spurs are at 6 a.m. breaking That's my heart. Funny. And then 10 a.m. the Seahawks uh, hopefully change the day from your 1 p.m. depending on where we are in the world. So So you guys are really just trying there. to build a network. Yeah, build a network yeah. and then hopefully we won't be as busy as we get more people to the network. Right now it's crazy. You know, we uh, both work probably 10, 12 hours a day, sometimes longer, but it's sports. It's fun. Nice. Keith, 
Are you done with the teaching school yet? No, I'm not. Oh. I know it's making, making for um, a lot of long days because we're getting close. But um, George, I had a question for you. You've yeah, traveled, absolutely. You've traveled a bunch, right? Yep. Um, where's the best beer? The best beer? That's a, I mean, it's such a cliche answer because everyone will say Germany, <laughs> right? <laughs> like it, all that area was really good. I, I only actually, I didn't even go to the city just at the airport in Germany. I'll be doing Europe next year. Uh, Japan has underrated beer, believe it or not. It's, you know, the very simple beer. I'm more of a scotch guy. So for me, scotch was, uh, you know, Japan is now really big on whiskey. So, but beer, I mean, everywhere has its own unique flavor and unique beer. Colombia had some really cool breweries this year. Mexico had is very standard beer, as you would probably assume it's the Modelo's and the Coronas. But I would say just just only from the airport, you can tell Germany has different type of beers. And I'm a I'm a Hefeweizen guy. That's my favorite type of beer. So Germany that was amazing Hef even at the mm-hmm. airport. Yeah, they're, What's your favorite type? They're, I, I I do the. Um, oh shit! You guys I got do, an hour and twenty. We got yeah. we got another <laughs> show coming so up. I do the I do the porter and stout thing. Okay, cool. Um, you know, Ireland of course has some good ones, but you're right about Japan. Um, most people think of Sapporo, and what yeah. we have as Sapporo in this country is made in Canada. It's not made in Japan, and, yeah. it's, not, and it's not good. Um, you actually go to Japan and and have it. It's a completely different beer. Completely, and, um, and it's way better. So yeah, they have some, they do have a surprisingly uh, robust selection there. And that, you know, um, they, they drink a lot in, in Japan. Like you wouldn't think Japanese culture is like a big drinking culture, but they drink a lot in a lot of different things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really, they really do. And one of the, the other thing that's weird there is that you've got, um, you know, genetically you've got, you know, the whole Asian glow thing. So a lot of them yeah. can't drink a lot. <laughs> But the, somehow the, the culture does consume a large amount of alcohol. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, I enjoyed my time there. And that yeah. was one of the reasons why it's one of a nice, it's one of the coolest countries I've ever been to. Yeah. It's amazing. Nice. I, I did. I did end up at a beer museum once in Belgium in Bruges. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And it was, a. Uh, it's a uh, pretty amazing if you if you're a big beer lover, if you ever ever end up somewhere near Belgium, mm-hmm. uh, in the small town of Bruges or small small not town but a small area of Bruges, they literally have like this this museum and you they have like hundreds and hundreds of beers on tap from every part of the world, and it is pretty amazing to go see and do like tastings there. You got to brace yourself, but it's a oh. <laughs> it is a fun adventure to go to a beer museum like that. That and sounds it, it was, amazing, is what yeah. that sounds. Yeah. Like. He thought he put that on his calendar for twenty twenty four. Look up the Bruges, <laughs> yeah. Look up the Bruges beer experience. It's B R U G E S beer experience, and you'll see this museum. Um, it is a. Uh, it's it's. I don't even know how to, explain, to explain, but it's something else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, guys, you guys are making me thirsty right now. That's hilarious. Yeah, actually, a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey guys, uh, we're going to wrap this thing up. It's been a fantastic conversation. You know, I really enjoyed the way that uh, we were able to blend uh, all of it together. We got to know you guys um, and uh, our listeners got to know you. They, you know, they have somebody else now that they can go to and listen to some Seahawks stuff and just the the range of, of topics and, and cultural stuff blended in with that, I think is, is very interesting. Um, So thank you for being on. Thank thank you for having us. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. We'd love to have you back again. And, and of course we'd, 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 uh, we'd come on your place too, just to uh, talk about some Seahawks stuff too. Um, Keith, you got any final thoughts? Um, No, we're at a minute or an hour 50. Let's um, let's wrap this up and uh, you know, uh, let our listeners go uh, do something else because this is a long one. <laughs> yeah. It's hey, man, not a, it's time not flies when having yet. fun. That's it does. Funny. That's funny. All right. So uh, they just told you where to find these guys, but uh, I'll remind you it's um, Pod That is their, their podcast um, at Sports on Tap. Or, and the sports on tap is the, is the website.com. And then uh, you can find George on tap, Sammy on tap, et cetera. Just uh, type on tap and you'll literally come to a menu that's about, you know, 50, 50 on taps and they, they pretty much have them all. So um, 
it was it was great having you on we look forward to uh to having you on again at, at some point to talk uh, some seahawks stuff uh you can find keith on twitter at myers nfl i'm at nw seahawk the show is at hawks playbook on twitter seahawksplaybook.com has all the shows and a whole bunch of other content we've just redesigned the entire website so go check it out and we're on youtube and your favorite podcast platforms so just look up seahawks playbook so until next time guys go hawks Uh seahawks playbook podcast listeners thanks for joining us for another edition of the show you can find us on twitter bill is at nw seahawk keith is at myers nfl and the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.